Let's discuss the four main reasons business acquisitions fail and how to protect ourselves from it. Now, this is an incredibly important subject that has a lot riding on it. I have some interesting stories and data to share with you on this subject, so let's talk about it. Welcome to the channel, everyone. I'm Cody Cook, managing partner of an investor partnership that focuses on buying businesses, so I have some knowledge about this. To learn more about that, check it out at ironoakcapitalpartners.com. Now, I was in a recent discussion with a buddy of mine named Mark. Mark is in the merger acquisition space, and he had had a discussion with a banker who works for one of the larger banks that focuses on SBA guarantees loans. This banker shared some very interesting information that I would like to share with you. So a brief explanation of SBA loans. So an SBA loan stands for Small Business Administration, which is a agency within the federal government that focuses on trying to help small businesses grow. Many years ago, the SBA set up a SBA guaranteed loan program. So how this works is somebody goes to a bank or a lending institution to get a loan for their business. Unfortunately, in most cases, lending institutions and banks do not like to lend to small business owners. So the SBA set up a program that would actually guarantee the loans from these banks and these lending institutions in case of default. So what this effectively did is it opened up a world of financing to small businesses that wasn't available otherwise. Now in this video, I'm not going to go into the economics of whether this is a good or bad idea for the economy as a whole. Instead, I'm going to discuss the actual statistics of the SBA itself and the repercussions of all of this. So SBA guaranteed loans are used for three primary reasons. One is they're used for startups of new businesses, they're used for expansion of existing businesses, or they're used for acquisitions of pre-existing businesses. So in this video, I'm going to focus on specifically SBA backed loans for acquisitions of established businesses. And I've actually heard these statistics from a couple of different sources. The first statistic is that there's a 2% default rate on SBA loans that are used for acquisitions. So that means out of every 100 deals that are backed by SBA guaranteed loans, only two of them will go into default at some point. Beyond that 2% default rate, about 10% will be stressed at some point over the term of that loan. Stressed meaning they haven't gone into default, but they're getting tight. Something in the business has gotten a little bit tight. So a 2% default rate and a 10% stress rate is not particularly terrible. When you dig deeper into the data, there are four primary reasons these business acquisitions start to struggle. And by understanding that, we can implement safeguards that can lower our risks even more and significantly increase our chances. I'm actually going to start with the least common reason and move up to the most common reason. So it's going to start with number four and we'll move all the way up to number one by the end of the video. So stick around. So let's start at the bottom of the list with reason number four. The new owner loses touch with customers or is not active in the community like the previous owner was. So I to know an example of this. Many years ago, I'm familiar with a gentleman by the name of Tom who was in the construction industry. And this is probably 30, 35 years ago. He sold a business at that time, I think it was approximately for $25 million. It was bought out by a private equity firm. This private equity firm, of course, went in, they changed a few things and they do what they normally do. But what was very interesting about this is Tom had built his business on personal contacts with his community. A lot of people in his subcontractors, a lot of different companies that worked with him on a regular basis were very familiar with Tom. Tom was very personal. He knew everyone. It was a big networking kind of group. The new buyer, however, a private equity firm, was actually not even located in the area. It was actually in a completely different city, thousands of miles away. And they didn't really have management and sales teams trained up to keep in communication and keep up with the local customer base. So they actually lost contact with the community. So over time, in the case of Tom's business, it just declined and declined and declined for several years. And if Tom eventually bought it back for $7 million, a business that he just sold for $25 million to these same people. Interesting side note of the story is he went on to regret grow the business back to where it was and sold it for something like $75 million a number of years later. So how do we make sure that this doesn't happen to us when we buy a business? Well, for starters, we need to make absolutely sure the sales team, the management team are all very focused on making sure they keep up with the customers as they leave the business over time. Often in some industries, it's really important for the previous owner to stick around. And so a common strategy that one could see is that you would keep the previous owner on, you kind of keep an office around in which the owner would occasionally show up, maybe once a week or even once a month. Usually you would explain it as, you know, Tom is starting to slowly move into retirement, he's backing away from the business a little bit, kind of explain that to the customers. And over time, as customers get used to this arrangement, the new owners will inherit the brand equity from the previous owner. So this strategy works very well to make sure that businesses transition from one owner to the other. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. The third reason, the seller poaches away employees after the acquisition. So an example of this, let's say we have bought a business from a seller and that seller has gone on and maybe they started another business, maybe they own another business. It sometimes happens that these sellers will will deliberately call up their old employees, like their manager, the COO, CEO of a company they just sold us, and try to hire them on to their new business. 
Now this can be pretty dangerous. In fact, research has shown that when acquiring businesses, if two or more of the top managers leave shortly after the acquisition, the chances of that acquisition succeeding goes down to that of a typical startup business. So keeping management on board is very important. Now, if you get to keep the management on board, the chances of success goes up dramatically, much, much higher than a startup. That's important to keep in mind. So how we protect ourselves from this is we basically put in place things like non-compete agreements, which unfortunately can only go so far. A lot of those you have to be very careful with those. Non-compete agreements are often very limited in what they can do in terms of scope. Other things we can do is just make sure we have a nice, comfortable environment for the staff. We don't want to go changing a lot of things. We don't want to upset them. We want to make sure they're paid well. But also seller financing can come in handy here. When a seller carries back a chunk of the business, they're much more careful about making sure that business succeeds after they've sold it. And I would also say it's very important here to evaluate the true plans of the seller. We need to really listen to the seller and really understand what the seller's long-term goals are because sometimes a seller may hint at other plans that can put us at risk for these kinds of situations. If you've enjoyed this video, please click that like button. It lets me know that you guys are enjoying this and I should do more videos like it. Reason number two is concentration issues. So what I mean by concentration issues, there's actually a lot of different ways to have a concentration issue. But for example, all the revenue may come from one or two customers. Maybe all the supplies come from only one or two suppliers. Or in the case of a retail business, for example, it has one location. And I've seen cases where a one location retail shop suddenly road construction out front it dramatically affects the ability for customers to get to the store and the store fails. In other cases, you may have special knowledge that's required by employees or special licensed employees that are required in order to run the business properly. That's another form of concentration issue because if that staff member leaves, it may be incredibly difficult to get a new staff member that can allow the business to continue to run. I am familiar with a number of examples in which somebody had bought a business. They had, say, like 30, 40, 50 percent of the sales came from one customer. This is unfortunately common in a lot of manufacturing businesses. That customer goes broke. That customer leaves, that customer changes direction, that customer starts to really hammer this business down on price, dramatically lowering the margins and putting this business into great peril. Concentration issues can often be very difficult. Now, in many cases, we just don't buy a business that already has a lot of concentration issues. It's usually one of the best ways to avoid this. That said, once we kind of recognize it though, we can work over time in a direction that will lower the concentration issues dramatically. Another alternative to protecting ourselves is actually the terms of the deal that we get into. So for for example, the seller carry back a big chunk of seller financing on an earnout, and that earnout is based around whether or not that major customer or major supplier or something stays in place and continues to buy or sell at the same rate as they have in the past. So you can protect yourself through deal terms in that way. So reason number one, and by far the most important reason, is the buyer goes in and changes stuff with the business. Think of a business as an intangible machine, okay? You actually cannot take a picture of a business. Sure, you can take a picture of a building. You can take pictures of inventory, of a equipment of employees working, but you cannot actually take a picture of a business because it's entirely intangible. All a business is, is a group of people with a group of assets using a set of invisible processes and systems that really only exist in everybody's head, selling to a group of customers. That's it. That's all a business really is when you look at it from a much wider view. What happens, unfortunately, in a lot of acquisitions, especially, and you hear this all the time with private equity firms, is they go in and they change a lot of stuff. Every time you start to change the processes, you're literally changing that machine. You change out a lot of assets, you're changing that machine. You change out the staff that works for the company, you're changing that machine, and so on. That would be equivalent to buying a car, opening up the hood, and starting to pull out parts and replacing it with parts that weren't really meant to be designed in that car in the first place. So by doing that, you can mess up this business machine, this cash flow machine that businesses are supposed to be. So what actually happens is buyers go in and they change these businesses. They fire employees, they move around assets, they do all kinds of different things that causes problems in the business and they goof up the business. You can see this in a lot of cases. You see it in really large companies all the time. This is one of the biggest issues with mergers. And this is one reason guys like Warren Buffett, for example, actually when they acquire businesses, they do not want to merge these businesses together very often. In most cases, because merging businesses together requires cultures to merge, which can be very difficult. And by trying to merge cultures, you end up in a situation where that inherently changes the processes and changes the people within the system. And it can bring on a tremendous amount of risk and dramatically lower the chances of the success of the acquisition. So how do we protect ourselves from this one? Well, the simple answer is just to change as little about the business as possible for at least the first year. That means we don't want to change the staff. We do not want to change the business systems, the models. Businesses, of course, they do have to evolve over time. In most cases, if you can keep top management in place, that's very, very important. If the seller of the business was the top management, in most cases, there should be a strong second employee in place, a strong lieutenant, so to speak, who can be promoted into the position of management. And so that overall, there's very little that'll actually 
actually change in the business. So I really wanna reemphasize that these issues are very important to understand and we must protect ourselves from these. Once these are understood and proper action is taken, success is much, much more likely. In the comments section below, please share with me some of your experiences and stories related to this subject. What have you seen with acquisitions in the past or additional insights you may have? I highly recommend this next video. It's been specially chosen just for you. I also wanna say I've left some important links in the description that might be pretty useful to you. And that is it for me today. Thank you for watching.